Amazing. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining this session. And happy 20th anniversary to OWAS. So amazing to be here. Something we do, I'm based in Australia, and something we do uh, before presentations in the Australian region is just pay our acknowledgements and respect to the traditional owners on the lands which we, we meet today. So I'd like to pay my acknowledgements and respect to the traditional owners here where I'm presenting from in a little country town called Narromine in country New South Wales. Great, Excellent. thank you so much, Dev Steve. Um, and we are all glad to be here. A bit about myself and Steve. Oh, this is what I do. Spoilers. I... Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. See, this is spooky, right? So this is what we are talking about. A bit about me. I am a security relations leader at Sneak. And uh, about uh, Steve, Steve, do you want to take it from here? Hello, I'm um, one of the senior developer advocates at Sneak, and I've been developing code since the, the age of eight, back in the days of QBasic, for those that don't remember it. But I've, yeah, had a long history as a or developer origin story as a developer, and now somebody embracing the shift left movement. Next slide. Uh, ready? We're here. There we go. So like I said, I've been writing code for many, many years. And as a developer, like even through working through digital agency and building out applications for big organization, or organizations, small, big, and sometimes just some, some passion projects. The thing I love most about being a dev is using my developer superpowers to be able to build applications really, really quickly. Click. The thing I've always been mindful of though, click. Next. Yeah, thank you. The thing I've always, oh, too far. Uh, the thing I've always been mindful about as a dev, though, is, and I've experienced this through my developer origin story, is just what is being surfaced in the things that I deploy, particularly building out um, using open source technologies, which I'm a big fan of as a, as a developer. All right. So when we talk about open source code, how much of an open source code is being used in an organization? If I talk about uh, any organization that I worked with and even the research where it says that 15 to 20% of the code which is built by an organization is a custom code and rest of the code on the internet is all open source code. Now we're talking about open source. We are part of OWASP, which is Open Web Application Security Project. There's so many projects and there are many of them are being used in the, uh, the, on the organizations, in the ecosystem. And I use personally a lot of them. Now, think about an application when 80 to 90% of the code is open source, will there be a problem? There could be some problems. Now, if you look at the screen, there are so many new packages which are, cre which are being created as part of the ecosystem every year. Like so many of them talk about from Maven Central to NPM to uh, PyPy to whatnot. We are seeing a huge shift from the uh, from the older ecosystem to the newer ecosystems, there are so many things which are being developed. But now, when they are being coming up in the picture, do we see vulnerabilities in them? Absolutely. Aren't we seeing the breaches that are happening? Now, what is the reason behind them? Now, when there is something new that comes up, we are all excited. Let's use this. Let's use this. Let's try this. But do we try and understand what exactly it comes up with? Now, when we say that, then comes the containers. Um, and the, yeah, this is something to um, something that's really important too, particularly from the development side of you, side of things, like keeping your code nice and clean and uh, free from vulnerabilities, or as free from vulnerabilities as you can, is just part of this um, holistic iceberg journey or a journey into your cool stack. Hey, that was a pun. Um, the other part of this is also keeping your infrastructure uh, as clean as possible too. So containerization from a development point of view is amazing or from a DevOps, from a holistic tech point of view, containerization is amazing. And what now obviously very widely adopted as we know as technologists, but we're also seeing the same vulnerabilities surface inside the, um, these components as well, or in these containers, which kind of makes sense given that they're built from the same open source, contain, uh, open source components that we see the, the vulnerabilities being surf surfaced in. And again, back to building applications to for my end users, it's important to keep your infrastructure as clean as possible so that, well, we protect our end users. And click. the way I like to think about this is with great containerization comes great responsibility. Think 
about infrastructure as a code. How much of infrastructure as a code is being used in the organization? Lot, lot. I want things to be spin up so fast. I want to make sure that I have a step-by-step -step instruction. If something happens, that I can spin up the whole instance, the whole network, just in one shot. And for the startup, for the unicorns, they want things to be fast. And not just them, even enterprises now want things to be fast. And they are running the whole infrastructure via infrastructure as a code. Now, if we see some bug in that, or if there is a bug since the beginning, where things can go wrong and where things can go tricky. Like I am spinning up my network, but that's been vulnerable since the inception. I am spinning up some storage space, but that is that is vulnerable. And even I don't know about it or I missed to check on that. Now that brings us to the point that are we missing something very, very important here? Steve, are we missing? Oh, we are. This is the most scariest part. I mean, the finding... Um, finding, you know, uh, attacked vulnerabilities inside your stack is obviously uh, scary enough. But as a developer, like one of the places that I, I'm able to build out these amazing apps is, I mean, that's that's my that's my sacred place. That's my special place where I get to build, experiment, and be able to use my developer superpowers. Mm. Dev environments. So do you want to go ahead and try something interesting, Dev, uh, Steve? I do. Um, just quickly, though, yeah, this is something we're now seeing. Um, the same vulnerabilities appear in developer environments, which, again, kind of makes sense, given that a lot of the extensions and add-ons through these different development environments, like Homebrew, for example, use the same components that we've just been talking about. Um, yeah, this is totally one of the scariest demos. Actually, there's a link on this slide too if anyone wants to try it themselves at home, but please do not leave these extensions installed and we're about to show you why. Um, yes, let's do the demo. Yes, all righties, we are here. So now um, let me go ahead and give it to Steve only because he's a developer. He wants to do something with his application. So Steve, do you want to talk about what you have in your environment? Yes. Uh, did you want me to switch screens quickly as well? Do you want oh, to use your yes. screen? Oh, I'll just use my screen because I have the same setup like yours. Like I have this Visual Studio okay. Code and I have all the extensions that you can think of, like the Instant Markdown plugin. Yeah, and that's the one we're using today. So recently we published um, some re security research around four particular plugins from uh, the VS Code ecosystem. Um, to give you idea, some idea on numbers, VS Code has 14 million monthly users and there's over 225,000 uh, extensions in the v VS Code ecosystem. So um, the one in particular we're looking at today is um, Instant Markdown, which basically as an extension lets you open um, a Markdown file and you can see some live edits in, which is kind of handy. It's important to note here, we're using version 1.4.6, uh, uh, which is the um, where this vulnerability surfaced. The current version 1.4.7, and please update if you haven't already for this particular one, uh, has the vulnerability fixed because we um, contributed back and let the, let the maintainer know so that they, they could get a patch in. Um, what we're doing today is the, so basically how this extension works is it opens a socket connection via, um, into the user's local host to be able to, so like I said, you can see the actual extension or the edits you make to a markdown file, you can see them live. And this exploit basically, or this vulnerability basically leverages that open connection to be able to lift a file, uh, doing a file traversal on the target user's computer. So, and it's the, the most scariest thing about this one is it's literally any file on the Mac on your computer. So password files, like you name it. Um, actually the first time we demoed this uh, on Sneak Live, uh, our manager basically had his password file from his Mac uh, on the live stream visible via, from remotely from the attacker or the security researcher. Security researcher foe attacker, if you will. Um, so the way we're doing that, and again, there's full write-ups on our side and also on my GitHub, I've got an example of how to walk through it and how to do it uh, for um, research purposes. Um, can you open the two files? Um, essentially, there's two files involved in this. And like I'm the demo, we're just doing this in PHP, but 
you could do the same thing in just about anything. So index.php is the link that the developer, um, the development environment opens that triggers, um, like you can see there, localhost 8090, which is the exposed port. And then we're basically going to try and grab like a particular target file. In this case, what we're doing on the target computer is we're opening in from the user's home directory, we're opening a file called passwords. Um, the, did you want to show the passwords file? Oh, yes, I am here. So on the, on the target computer, which is Vandana's computer, she's going to hack her own computer. Um, yeah, you can see that there's a passwords file. This is a bit like a capture the flag demo, if you will. <laughs> so yeah, you can see she's got a file with can't touch this um, password in just as text inside that particular file. Um, yeah, so that's basically yeah. the attack part of it. Um, the other part is what this what this index file is going to do, or what this index script is going to do, is try and find that particular file on the target user's computer, and then send it to a, a listening um, post or track.php post. Um, uh, listening file. It's basically just going to capture any post data from that attack and then just store it in a text file in, back into the host user's directory. Um, and we're just See, using ngrok to do this. Steve, let's do them. I think uh, we've it. talked enough. Yes. So here, uh, this is my server, which is like, this is my code where I want to pick up files from Steve's system. And here I'm running a PHP server where you can see that we've been trying this, we've been testing it because sometimes the demo gods don't shower their blessings on us. <laughs> and this happens, I think, with everyone. So when they don't, <laughs> we have a PHP server running and you must be thinking that PHP server is running a local host on 8.1.2.2. I totally agree, but I am using an ngrok to make sure that that's being pointed to my own domain, subdomain. Like if I tell you my website, it is infosecwandana.com and you can see me as infosecwandana.com everywhere on Twitter and on all the other places. Now, when then that's there, uh, I'll just take you, okay, do this. Where is my browser? Okay, here you go. So this is my browser. I'm going to go ahead and open infosecwandana.com. Oh, it's open. So now you might want to look up, but here, there might be something like I've told you, infosecvandana.ngrok.io. Will you open, Steve, if I give you as a friend? Like, you know me uh, for a very long time now. I would. And I think this is, yeah, and this is part of the social engineering part of this, like, too, I think, is this would be done in a uh, malicious social engineering way where you send the link to somebody and go, you should see this. This is the funniest thing ever. And then we open yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. We're trying to open. <gasps> oh, you've been hacked. Steve? Dun, dun, dun. Oh, no. Shh. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's go back and see if something has happened here. There are things like, so this is my code. And where I ran the script, where I actually asked Steve to open it. Now, there was something which is supposed to happen. Here, there is one thing. Important thing to note is that it will only work if this instant markdown plugin is open. Now, as this instant markdown plugin is open, if any of you would run here, I'll show you the screen. There are things, if you see this, there are changes which are happening here. I would be able to see who is trying to access it. There could be hundreds of people. Now, this is locally running. But think about if I have a server set up and I am running this and there are so many people who, has, who are coming to it and how much of a data I can pull in from here. And it's just a small script that I have kept on my subdomain, wherein I can do wonders with it. Like here, I have my Visual Studio code running and I can do anything that I want. And that's when, if you see here, I was running that and here I got this file. Now, if there are many people who are trying this like on a continuous basis, there could be multiple files that I'll be getting. And similarly, my server will keep showing me that yes, there are things which are working. And if you see here, that it keeps moving on on the regular interval. And now one important thing to note is that why are we talking about these, uh, these things here? Now, the most important thing is a lot of times 
we tend to miss out on updating few things. Could be a plugin, could be a browser, could be our ecosystem. Do we, do, we, do we just update it right away? We don't even update our phone right away. Or at times in organizations, there is always a patching cycle, which takes the time, which, uh, which, which after a while being tested, then only being patched. Um, if I go back in time, like a couple of years back, what happened to, um, to Equifax? Uh, and, and it's not just the Equifax story. It can happen with any organization wherein if uh, there is a patch which has been available and if we don't update it right away or uh, within a period of time, it we can be vulnerable. And there are organizations which are still vulnerable. And even the individual websites, we are using a certain plugin from WordPress. They have an update and we are not updating it. In this case, what happened? We were using this instant markdown plugin, which is running on 1.4.6, and there's an updated version, but we did not intentionally update it. Right, right, Steve? Yeah, we, we totally didn't. Um, and I think that's important. One of the things, just um, some of the stuff you were saying there in particular, like making sure you do those updates and keep abreast of like the security alerts. As developers, like even using Homebrew, there's so many times that I install something and then never use, like use it once, never use it again. But it's important that we um, maybe do like a spring cleaning and go through and uninstall or remove the things you're not using. But also remember to do that brew update, do that VS Code update to get the latest version of something. Um, it's important to keep that stuff updated, but as, as it is to remove the things you're not using, just to make sure you keep your development environment clean. Because we are seeing like a lot more of these instances where your development environment is just as exposed as any other infrastructure that you manage. Oh, we already hacked it, right? We already did it. We did it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, Steve mentioned that, yes, you can actually uh, check out this extension on this blog, as well as uh, uh, this, uh, these talks would be, I'm sure, would be shared with you where you can actually take a look at it, that how we did it. But it was just a one-off incidents that we wanted to show you that the things can go wrong in any direction if we don't keep our environment up to date. And um, there are times when we tend to miss on things like, We've downloaded it, but we never used it, but it's still part of our environment. And you never know who is going to catch hold of us at what time. And that's when be aware of what you have in your dev environment. Right, Steve? Totally need to. I continually now check my own local environments to make sure. In fact, when I do this demo, I actually run OSX inside VM because this one scares me so much and I don't want to install this stuff in my <laughs> environment. Um, but it's just as important to be always scanning as well for, um, of course, with source code, um, containers, in infrastructure as well to making sure you keep keep everything like nice and clear. Like as, as technology and or people that embrace technology, it's important to keep our end users safe. Like keep your infrastructure nice and clean, keep their data safe. You want to make sure those users that are using your deployed application, be them external and public or even inside a company just through intranet, et cetera, you want to make sure you keep their experience nice and clean and vulnerability free. <gasps> SneakCon is coming. Are you excited? I just wanted to mention this one quickly. Um, so in October, um, SneakCon is coming, some amazing speakers, um, including Troy Hunt and, and a whole bunch of others just coming together to share their, share their knowledge and freely learn from each other. Absolutely. And just lastly, so, no, go ahead. Go. Uh, just lastly, um, yeah, please remember to make sure you always use your tech superpowers for good. I do love this gift. And remember to be excellent to each other. Absolutely. And if you don't be good to each other, there could be things that could go wrong in any direction. Like if I don't speak to Steve almost every other day, like when we are talking about any new environment, oh, you don't know what I'm going to be putting in his environment and we'll be showing it to him. Right, Steve? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to us. I know that uh, we wanted to make it spooky and we spooked out in the uh, in the beginning itself. So uh, these are the things which are, which looks very simple, but they can be very, very tricky if we don't manage them on time with the right set of security.
and security is not just my responsibility as a security person or dev dev steve's responsibility as a developer it's everyone's responsibility my responsibility is to understand the environment and if i don't understand the environment i might be bringing in vulnerabilities or i might not even be able to help people in resolving those vulnerabilities and if as a developer steve says that it's not my responsibility i can't work on it because i have to work on my uh, development environment the custom code that i'm writing on the cloud environment on storage and what not and i would not be able to do it then trust me we all will be vulnerable and we don't know when the uh, hard reality would hit us yep that no i totally right just be aware of what you're using and um, yeah keep those end users safe Yes, absolutely, absolutely.